video for chapter seven. And the focus of this chapter is upper air pressure and wind. And what I'm going to be doing in this video is obviously following the text pretty closely. But my purpose here is to sort of outline the characteristics of the upper atmosphere. And when I say upper atmosphere, what I really mean here is the atmosphere in the mid to upper levels of the troposphere. We may go down as low as maybe 850 millibars, but what we're really going to be focused on here for the most part is 500 millibars and above up to about maybe 200 to 150 millibars. So just know in this course and in meteorology in general, when we say upper atmosphere or upper air, we're really talking about the mid to upper levels of the troposphere. So, Let's talk about pressure a little bit, and I've already mentioned that pressure is a measure of weight, and when we're talking about atmospheric weight in our class and meteorology, we measure weight in millibars. And so, at the surface, the atmospheric weight is about a thousand millibars. And when I say weight, I'm talking about the weight of the entire atmospheric column from the top of the atmosphere all the way down to the surface. And so, just like with people, weight always decreases with height, and so in the atmosphere, the weight is going to decrease from around 1,000 millibars all the way down to zero millibars when we reach the top of the atmosphere. Also, as I mentioned in, in Chapter 5 or Chapter 6, when talking about basic variables, that when we talk about the rate of, of decrease of pressure or weight in the atmosphere, it's different than that for people. So people, our weight or pressure decreases relatively uniformly with height, but in the atmosphere, the pressure is a exponential function. In better words, pressure decreases exponentially with height. So I've already kind of covered these basic characteristics. And so this is a really nice diagram that just kind of shows this exponential decrease of pressure with height. And the level, roughly speaking, it varies. It's, there's not a set value here, but the basic levels at which you find each of these atmospheric pressures. So these are basically called standard levels in meteorology, so the standard altitude, the standard elevation for 925 millibars is 1500 meters, for 850 millibars it's 1500 meters, and so on. And just like pressure, density decreases exponentially with height, and so this just shows that the air's density decreases as you go upward through the atmosphere. <clears throat> now, let's actually go into our slideshow. I actually meant to start the slideshow with that, but that's fine. Let's get things started right now. So here are our pressure characteristics and pressure decreases exponentially with height. A couple other characteristics about pressure, and again, just like with chapter six, I discussed a lot of this in my weather and climate and my, media, and my weather studies laboratory classes. So for those of you who have not taken geography 1250 or 1260, you have some catching up to do. I'm gonna move through this relatively quickly. So in terms of pressure characteristics, what an, imp an important characteristic of the atmosphere is that as air becomes colder, it becomes more compressed, more dense. And as a result of that, the vertical rate of pressure decrease is greater in cold air than it is in warm air. In better words, pressure decreases more rapidly with height in cold air. Now, the consequence of that is, for example, that because the rate of pressure decrease being larger in colder air, what you see, for example, <clears throat> is that the altitude at which you find pressure decreasing from 1,000 to 500 millibars is lower in cold air and higher in warm air. And again, this is simply because pressure decreases more rapidly with height in cold air than in warm air. We're going to come back to this principle later on in the presentation, and we'll use this to explain why the jet stream is found near the tropopause in the atmosphere. In terms of pressure characteristics, because of the fact that pressure decreases more rapidly with height in cold air than it does in warm air, if we just consider one pressure value, and in this case, we're gonna take a look at 500 millibars and the height of the 500 millibar level, what we see as a function of latitude is that the height of the 500 millibar level actually decreases from equator to pole. So it decreases from about, on average, from about 58, 50 meters all the way down to about 5,300 meters by the time you get to just about the North Pole. And this is entirely a consequence of the fact that as you move from equator to pole, the atmosphere gets colder, and so the air becomes more dense, more compressed, and that vertical rate of pressure decrease becomes larger as the air, as the column becomes colder. And that's what you see here in this particular figure. So the height of an upper level pressure surface decreases with increasing latitude. 
And so again, this is totally this is totally intuitive if you think about the, the density of air increasing as its temperature decreases. Now I want to just continue to focus on pressure characteristics. Now what I'm going to do in this particular slide is I want to start by showing basically, and this is a schematic obviously, the schematic of what it is that pressure variations look like on a constant altitude map. Now if you think about our surface maps, and I covered this in chapter 6, when we take a look at pressure at the surface, we're not really looking at surface pressure. What we're looking at on a surface map is pressure values adjusted to mean sea level. So we treat the surface as a horizontal plane of sea level. So what we're really looking at when we take a look at isobars on a surface map is we're basically looking at an isobar pattern assuming that the surface has all been adjusted down to mean sea level. So if we take a look at a different horizontal surface, and in this case we're going to choose a horizontal surface about 5,500 meters above the surface, what you see is that our pressure values are basically just around 500 millibars. So 508 millibars, 4, 500, 496, 492, using our same 4 millibar contour interval. Now a couple of interesting characteristics, and we'll talk about this in the slide or two, is you'll see that instead of having circular isobaric patterns, our isobaric pattern now looks very much like waves. So you can see these waves basically moving across the United States, or basically positioned across the United States. And we have a ridge of high pressure, in this case over the Intermountain West, and we have a trough of low pressure over the interior eastern part of the country, over the Appalachians. So this is what it looks like in terms of an isobar pattern on a constant height map. Now, we actually can look at this a little bit differently, and instead of taking a look at a constant height surface, we can take a look at a constant pressure surface. So the next map I put up is going to be the same exact example, except what we're looking at now is a surface where the pressure is everywhere 500 millibars. And now instead of taking a look at how pressure varies on a constant altitude map, which is what we have on the left, now what we're looking at is how altitude or elevation varies on a constant pressure map. So now on this map on the right, everywhere the pressure is 500 millibars, and what these values are, are altitudes, or elevations above sea level. So what we see here is that the heights just like pressure on the left, the heights decrease from south to north. We still have our waves. We still have our ridge in the west, our trough in the east. And so we have a situation here where our maps are basically identical in terms of appearance, even though we're looking at two different fields. Again, the left, what we're looking at are how pressures vary on a constant height surface. And on the right, we're looking at how heights vary on a constant pressure surface. Now, in meteorology, in atmospheric sciences, Basically, what we would prefer to do and what we do is we actually take a look at this right-hand map. We take a look and we focus on how heights vary on a constant pressure surface. So why do we do this? Because we're actually used to looking at pressure variations. We're used to looking at isobars. This is what we do at the surface. And isobars are simply a measure of the weight of the atmosphere above whatever horizontal plane we're looking at. So why do we make this transition to what is initially a more confusing concept, which is this variation of altitude or height on a constant pressure surface. And the reason for this is if you consider our left-hand map, and we're looking at pressures above this constant altitude of 5,500 meters, what this map tells us basically is simply what the weight of the atmosphere is above this horizontal plane. And that's it. All we're learning is weight or pressure. That's all, the only information we're getting. Obviously, we get the variations but it's just weight. If we take a look at our right-hand map, we already know that the pressure is 500 millibars. But what these, what these altitudes or these heights above 1,000 millibars tell us is something about the actual temperature of the air from the surface up to 500 millibars. So if we have a high height, what that means is that the column temperature is warm. If the column temperature is warm, then the air is less dense and the column expands and we have higher heights. And then as these heights get lower, the mean temperature in the column is getting colder. And of course, you would expect that as you move from equator to pole. <clears throat> so what we see here in these upper levels is that not only do we have pressure information, 500 millibars, but we also get some information about the mean temperature of a column from 500 millibars down to the surface, down to 1,000 millibars. 
All right, so we get this additional temperature information. So now when we take a look at our map and we add our ridge and trough, just like we have on the left-hand side, our ridge now means not only do we have an axis of higher heights, but we know that those higher heights also equate with larger or warmer temperatures. So an axis of a ridge actually is an axis of warm column temperatures. An axis of a trough now, an axis of lower heights, corresponds to an axis of colder temperatures. Now what you're going to see is that if you move across a latitude line, you're going to see in a ridge that the heights are higher. So for a given latitude in a ridge, the heights are higher and the column is warmer. For the same latitude in the trough, the heights are going to be lower and the columns are going to be colder. But within a specific ridge or trough, you're still going to see that within the ridge itself, heights are still going to decrease from south to north because temperatures still decrease from equator to pole. Similarly, in the trough, as you move from equator to pole, from south to north, you're going to still see heights decrease because, again, temperatures are still going to be decreasing from equator to pole. The upshot is that in our class and in atmospheric sciences, meteorology in general, we are always going to look at the upper levels. When we take a look at maps, we're going to be taking a look at how heights vary on constant pressure surfaces. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about basically how this develops, how we get these waves like we saw on this last slide. Because in fact, this is pretty much what we see in upper levels. We see wave patterns versus closed isobaric circular patterns, which are more common at the surface. So let's talk about this development of waves and how it happens. So imagine that you start out <clears throat> with straight flow. So here are constant height lines, higher heights to the south, lower heights to the north. And so if we actually talk about flow, and we'll see this in a few moments when we develop the geostrophic wind, the flow is actually going to be parallel to, the, to these iso heights, just like it would be parallel to isobars at the surface. So it's going to be geostrophic. So if our winds are simply straight west to east, because of the spherical shape of the Earth, what we see is that the energy balance at the low, at the low latitudes is such that we get more energy in from the sun than the Earth loses to space. So over time, these low latitudes are going to be gaining energy and warming up. The high latitudes, on the other hand, in terms of the climatology of energy, over a year, what happens is that these latitudes lose more energy to space than they get from the sun, and so over time, they're going to get colder and colder. Now, if we allow this to happen, what happens is that because of these big temperature differences that develop between the equator and the pole, we end up getting a much larger pressure gradient force. And what that ultimately will cause is colder air to begin to work towards the south and warmer air to begin to work towards the north. So the shape of the planet leads to big temperature differences. Big temperature differences ultimately lead to large pressure and density differences, and then air is on the move. And what we see is that colder air ultimately begins to move from high latitudes to low latitudes, and warm air begins to move from low latitudes to high latitudes. In the context of air masses, which I cover in both Geography 1250 and 1260, this is simply the movement of polar and tropical air masses from their source regions towards the mid-latitudes where we end up getting our frontal zones in general. But as we get this cold air movement towards the south and this warm air movement towards the north, the height patterns, the height patterns respond. So as cold air sinks towards the south, the heights also sag towards the south. And we end up getting the formation of a trough, indicating that we have an axis of cold air where our polar air mass is actually moving towards the south. Conversely, where we have tropical air masses moving towards the north as the, as the column warms, then we'll end up getting higher heights for our given pressure surface, and as a result, we'll get the formation of a ridge. So these troughs and ridges, again, correspond to the locations of polar and tropical air masses, which are then reflected in the heights of these cold and warm columns in troughs and ridges, respectively. So this is kind of the theory of how these waves evolve over time. So let's talk about upper level height variations. And this is, this is a figure straight from your text. And so what we have now is an example of a 500 millibar map. And in this case, the heights are actually shaded from the warmest reds to the coldest blues, and our heights are in meters here. And what you see is that not only do we have a ridge in the west and a trough in the east, but this color coding is also meant to indicate how temperatures of the columns vary. 
And so what you see is that on our ridge, we obviously have warmer temperatures, but temperatures still decrease from equator to pole, so our column heights are still going to be it decreasing from equator to pole in the ridge. In our trough axis, not surprisingly, you have lower heights, colder temperatures, and even though it is relatively warm in the south, you can again see this very rapid decrease in height and therefore this very rapid decrease in mean column temperature as we head from south to north. Now, I personally really don't enjoy looking at shaded maps. It, our maps our maps in meteorology are already quite noisy, and so this adds another level of complexity. So I really do expect and want you to understand that when you take a look at an upper level map and you see a low height, that that low height corresponds to a cold column temperature, and that a high height corresponds to a warm column temperature. Just keep in mind also, because it's going to become important later on when I talk about tropopause temperatures, that just because the mean temperature of a column is warm or cold, that doesn't mean that the column is uniformly warm or cold through its entire depth. The warm air or the cold air can be concentrated at different altitudes in the column. So when we take a look at these colors, we're really focusing on mean column temperature, not the temperature of the column at any single level going up from the surface to, in this case, 500 millibars. Just to give you some idea of schematics and three dimensions of what these maps might look like. And so what we have here, and again, I believe this is from your text, is we have a couple of, we have a couple of uh, maps, basically, topographic maps of surfaces where we have water and then we have land, and our land obviously has terrain on it. And what these, what these gridded surfaces above them are meant to do is to indicate the topography of the surface and how the altitude or elevation of this surface is varying across space. And so you can see this on the upper level, you can see it on the lower level. So our upper level maps are really similar to topographic maps. And if you actually were to map it in three dimensions, our upper level maps would look something like this, where we would have troughs and ridges. Now, now a land surface like this doesn't really illustrate particularly well what ridges and troughs actually look like in three dimensions. And so here's a second example. So here's a, a different illustration of the same principle. And in this case, what we have is the runner for, for a rug or a carpet. And so if you bunch up this piece of carpeting, you can see that we have these ridges and troughs in our runner. And so this is really a much better example of what it is that our atmospheric waves look like, what our ridges and troughs look like in three dimensions. So the ridge basically indicates that the mean, that the height of the column from the surface to wherever this ridge is, is higher, indicating a warmer temperature, and the trough indicates lower heights, colder column temperatures. So warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. And so high corresponds to warm, low corresponds to cold. And so I really like this graphic much more than the previous one. All right, now I want to go forward now and talk about some characteristics of the upper atmosphere. So this first slide is going to focus on vertical integrity. So this is a map of an 850 millibar pattern. So this is, a, again, like all the maps it seems like in our book, a lot of these are pretty old, but they get the point across. So there is no such thing as newer and older ridges and troughs. They behave exactly the same way in 2023 or 2024 as they did in 2008, 2009. So this example, although old, is just perfectly fine. We have a ridge in the west, a trough in the east, and this is at 850 millibars. And so the point that I want to make here is that the integrity of this ridge trough pattern is maintained as you move your way up through the troposphere. So wave patterns maintain their configurations through the depth of the troposphere. One characteristic that you will notice, and that I will point this out as we move through our session in later videos, is that while the integrity is maintained, the axes of the ridges and troughs as you move higher up in the atmosphere tend to lean back to the west. So for example, at 850 millibars, you'll see that the axis of the ridge is just in from the west coast, and at 200 millibars or 300 millibars, it's much more along, along the west coast. In terms of the trough, you'll see that it's over, over the eastern and central lakes, and then at 300 millibars, it's much more over uh, the upper Midwest. So it arches back to the west. So again, 
As you move up through the atmosphere, the wave patterns maintain their integrity, but they tend to lean back a bit towards the west as you move higher up through the troposphere. <clears throat> in terms of wave amplitude, there are two types of waves in terms of amplitude that we'll discuss in our class. The first one is a meridional wave pattern. Meridional waves, wave patterns are high amplitude. In better words, you'll see that the ridges are quite sharp and they have a lot of amplitude to them, and the troughs are quite sharp and they have a lot of amplitude as well. What a meridional pattern basically tells us is that in the ridge, the warm air intrudes far to the north, and in the trough, the cold air intrudes far to the south. So when we have a meridional pattern, we tend to experience extremes in our weather. On the other hand, we can have a very low amplitude or zonal pattern. And now if you take a look at, at the circulation or the pattern across the United States, you'll see there's a very subtle uh, trough in the Intermountain West, and then basically it's straight flow across the rest of the country. So so zonal patterns are very, very flat, very low amplitude waves to the extent that we have waves in them. And typically when we have zonal flow, you'll see that the cold air is pretty much bottled up to the north. The really warm air is bottled up to the south. And we tend to have fairly fast flow across the United States. And we tend to get relatively weak highs and lows with a lot of weather disturbances or lows moving across the country relatively quickly. So we'll see meridional and zonal wave patterns in our class, and we see this in the atmosphere all the time. Okay, now I'm going to relate height and temperature. Now remember I said that low heights correspond to cold or low mean column temperatures, and high heights correspond to warm or high mean column temperatures. So on the left-hand map, what we have now is a 500 millibar map from 12Z on May 1st, 2004. We have a pretty high amplitude ridge in the west and a, a high amplitude trough in the middle of the country. And low or high heights, they tend to correspond pretty well with temperature anomalies at the surface. So if we've got a really sharp ridge in the west, what you'll see is that temperature anomalies in the west tend to be pretty positive. And if we have a sharp trough in the middle, middle of the country, you'll see these large negative temperature anomalies. Just to remind you, an anomaly is a deviation from the mean. So a positive temperature anomaly means it's warmer than normal. A negative temperature anomaly means that it's colder than normal. So even though when we're looking at heights, this, this technically corresponds to mean column temperature, we see that it also aligns fairly well with temperature anomalies at the Earth's surface at the same time. And just for completeness and to finish it off, you'll see again more positive temperature anomalies beneath the ridge that's just positioned just to the east of the East Coast. Okay, now I'm going to talk about tropopause pause temperature. And so I told you that, that this notion of mean column temperature versus where, where the coldest or warmest air in the column temperature is located matters. So here is an example of triple pause temperatures, in this case, right around 150 millibars for this particular example on November 7, 2004. And I believe, no, unfortunately, it's not the same date as our previous slide. So let's get to this, though. What you see is that we have an area of really cold triple pause temperatures in the middle of the country. And although it's cold everywhere, we have slightly warmer temperatures along the east and the west coasts. Now, interestingly enough, what we find is that the coldest tropopause temperatures are actually located where the highest heights are located as well. So while the height of the tropopause over the middle of the country, it turns out, is largest or highest in this case, we end up with the coldest tropopause temperatures because temperature is decreasing with height all the way through the troposphere until you get to the tropopause. And because the tropopause is so high, it's really, really cold at the top of this column. Conversely, where we have troughs, where the column temperature is cold, the heights are low when you get to the tropopause. And so even though the columns, as a, in terms of their mean temperature, is cold, the fact is that because you don't have to go up as far to reach the tropopause in these cold columns, the top of the column is relatively warm. And then you'll see, as you move into Canada, where the coldest air is located, it turns out that because where the coldest air is located, we also find our lowest tropopause heights. This also corresponds to our warmest temperatures at tropopause level. So just keep in mind that when we're talking about the tropopause, that really cold tropopause temperatures correspond to high heights 
and warm column temperatures, while much warmer triple positive temperatures correspond to cold columns, low heights, but warm temperatures near the top, relatively speaking. So the lowest tropopause temperatures are found in the warmest columns, and again, this is average temperature because the tropopause has the highest heights over these locations. All right, let's move forward. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to evolve the geostrophic wind, and actually this is identical to what I discussed in Chapter 6. Now the text likes to talk about a height gradient force versus a pressure gradient force because technically speaking, the pressure on an upper level map is constant. It's the same everywhere. But meteorologists still refer to this force as the pressure gradient force. So in the context of upper levels, the height gradient force or the pressure gradient force still points from high to low. It still is perpendicular to the lines. In these cases, they're not isobars, but these are iso heights, H-E-I-G-H-T-S. So the pressure gradient force, and I'm going to continue to call it the pressure gradient force, is perpendicular to the iso heights. Again, the pressure gradient force is the only force that can work on air that is not in motion. So this is going to initiate the motion. Once the air begins to move, the Coriolis force will begin to act 90 degrees to the right of the wind. And there will be an imbalance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces, just like we have at the surface. The wind will try and split the difference and strike a balance. In order for this to occur, the wind has to accelerate. The Coriolis force magnitude has to increase, which will continue to pull the wind around to the right. And so this is just an, another step along the way. But eventually what we'll see is that our wind will strike a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces, and it is the geostrophic wind. And the same rules apply. So the geostrophic wind blows parallel to the iso heights, with now low heights on its left, high heights on its right. The magnitudes of the pressure, and pressure gradient and Coriolis forces are identical, and the forces point in the opposite direction. So just like at the surface, the upper level geostrophic wind represents a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. Now the nice thing about the upper level geostrophic wind is that instead of it just having low heights to the left and high heights to the south, we can actually say something about temperature. The geostrophic wind at upper levels blows of cold air to its left and warm air to its right. And so again, looking at how heights vary on a constant pressure surface gives us additional information about the temperature field, which is really, really useful. Okay, let's talk about the fact that as we move up from the surface and we start looking at our upper level wind fields, that friction becomes negligible as we move above the surface. So if we take a look at a surface map for a particular example, here's a low pressure system that is centered over Southeast South Dakota. And you can see that if we take a look at the winds, which pretty much represent a balance between the pressure gradient, Coriolis, and frictional forces, you can see our counterclockwise and inward directed circulation as you would expect around a center of surface low pressure. Now, if we take a look at what's going on above the surface at 850 millibars, a couple of things happen here, and these should not be surprises. First of all, not surprisingly, as you move away from the surface and friction decreases, the wind speed increases. And so you can see much higher wind speeds in this example at 850 millibars versus at the surface. Now, if you look carefully, and it's not quite obvious 850 millibars, but you begin to see it, what you'll also know, particularly here in the east where the wind speeds are higher, is you'll see that the winds begin to parallel our iso heights, where at the surface they cross the, the iso bars at an angle. And so what we see is as we begin to lose friction as we move upward from the surface is that wind speeds increase and the winds increasingly parallel the iso heights. And this is really true for wind speeds that are greater than about 30 or 35 knots. Once we lose friction and the wind speeds exceed about 30 to 35 knots, the winds really do begin to parallel the iso heights. Even at upper levels where there's no friction, if the wind speeds are really, really slow, much slower than 35 knots, you'll still see some crossing of the isobars. It still tends to be a little bit messier. So wind speed increases with height, and the flow becomes more parallel to the iso heights as you move up from the surface and lose that friction. And here's what the same pattern looks like at 500 millibars. So now you can see our wind speeds 
really begin to pick up. You can see a little bit of crossing at angles still for these for our slowest winds, but as soon as the wind speeds really begin to pick up, you see this paralleling of these stronger winds with the ISO heights. I also want to point out, as I discussed earlier, that as you move up from the surface and you begin to go upward through the troposphere, that low pressure and then low heights arches back towards the west with height. So our surface low is over southeast South Dakota, 850 millibars. The surface low is over central South Dakota. And by the time you get to 500 millibars, the, surf, the 500 millibar low is over eastern Wyoming. So you see again this arching back of our low with height as we move up from the surface. Now, the upper level wind speeds are ultimately determined by the magnitude of the pressure gradient force. This is a 200 millibar, I, I think it's a 200 millibar map, and what you see here are 200 millibar ISO heights, and you see shading indicated wind speeds. Now, meteorologists define the jet stream as being located where wind speeds exceed 70 knots. Now, at the, the contour interval at which we take a look at our heights varies depending on the height level we're at. So for example, here at 200 millibars, 300 millibars, the contour interval is 120 meters. At 500 millibars, the contour interval is 60 meters. At 850 millibars, the contour interval is 30 meters. So when you take a look at upper level maps, and you take a look at the ISO heights, you need to keep in mind that the contour intervals are not constant at each one of these upper levels. So what we see here is that at this 120 meter contour interval, that we have these areas where the pressure gradient force is large, where our packing of the ISO heights is large, where we have our stronger wind speeds, and where we have less packing, our wind speeds are slower. Now the jet stream is basically a channel of very rapidly moving air through the troposphere. And the jet stream is strongest right by the tropopause, and tropopause level varies depending on the temperature of the column. It can be as high as 150 or 200 millibars in really warm columns, and it can be as low as 300 millibars in very cold columns. So just keep in mind that the upper level wind speeds are ultimately determined by the pressure gradient force magnitude, just like they are at the surface, by the way. Surface winds also, in terms of speed, are a function of the magnitude of the pressure gradient force. Now, I'm going to move away from the jet stream for a few minutes, and I'm going to come back to it. So what I want to talk about is how we get and how we see our pressure gradient forces at upper levels, given the fact that our maps are all on constant pressure surfaces. So what I have now in this particular figure is a schematic where we have a warm column on the left, a cold column on the right. Keep in mind from the beginning of this video when I said that the rate of pressure decrease, the vertical rate of pressure decrease is greater in cold air than it is in warm air. So if we assume that the weight of the atmospheric column in both locations is 1,000 millibars and we have our cold and warm air, what we're going to see is that pressure decreases more rapidly with height in the cold air than it does in the warm air. So if we want to see how high up we have to go into each column for the pressure to decrease from 1,000 to 500 millibars, what you'll see is that you actually have to go higher up in the warm column for the pressure to fall to 500 millibars versus the cold column because the vertical rate of temperature de of pressure decrease is greater in the cold column. So, so basically we see, as we've already seen on our maps, that for a given pressure surface, and we look at 500 millibars a lot, the height is going to be lower in the cold column than it will in the warm column. Now, if we just consider a horizontal slice through our column, so a horizontal slice, what we'll see if we take this horizontal slice, in this example, you'll see the slice grazes the 500 millibar level in our cold column, but in the warm column, the, the pressure is actually higher. It's 550 millibars because the pressure has not yet fallen to 500 millibars. So for a, for a horizontal surface, what we see is our pressure gradient force is always going to be directed from our warm to our cold column. Not only that, but the magnitude of the pressure gradient force in terms of the size of the difference in pressure for each of these horizontal surfaces, the magnitude is going to get greater and greater and greater as you go higher up in the atmosphere. So you can see there's no pressure gradient force at the surface, and then this pressure gradient force begins to develop as you move upward through the atmosphere because of the differing rates of pressure decrease in the columns.
And so you see again, this pressure gradient force directed from warm to cold columns, and the magnitude of this decrease is going to increase as you go up. So it turns out that the increase in wind speed as you move upward from the surface isn't just caused by the loss of friction. We also get increasing winds as we move upward from the surface because of this developing pressure gradient force from warm to cold air, from equator to pole, essentially speaking. So we get these larger equator to pole pressure gradient forces higher up in the atmosphere because of these differing rates of vertical pressure decrease between cold and warm columns of air. Now let's just take a look at how this plays out. So now we have south on the right-hand side, north on the left-hand side. This is from your text. And what you see is that each one of these white lines corresponds to a constant pressure surface. And so you'll see that the altitude of these constant pressure surfaces is higher over the warm air and lower over the cold air. Now in the mid-latitudes where we live, this is where the transition zones between our tropical and our polar air masses exist. So the big gradients or differences between the heights in the tropics and the polar regions, the big differences or gradients develop where we live in the middle latitudes. And so what you begin to see for a given pressure level is you'll begin to see this incline or the decline of a single, single pressure level from higher heights in the tropics to lower heights in polar regions. And if you actually were to draw a horizontal, horizontal line right through it, what you would see is that pressure is changing most rapidly through this area of incline or decline in the constant pressure surface. So pressure decreases more rapidly with height in the cold air. The pressure gradient force develops in the region between the tropical and the polar air masses, in better words, in the, in the mid-latitudes where we live. And this is where the slope of the, of the pressure surface becomes steep. And so what we see is that, in fact, the pressure gradient maximum is going to occur at the base of the tropopause, in the cold air. Because once we reach the tropopause in the cold air at this altitude and we go up, temperature stops decreasing with height in the cold air as we continue to go up. In fact, as we go up, the temperature might actually begin to increase with height. Meanwhile, temperatures are still decreasing with height in the cold air because we're still in the troposphere. And so the temperature difference at these high altitudes above the tropopause in the high latitudes, the temperature difference begins to even out because temperatures cease to fall in the high latitudes where it's already colder. They continue to fall in the low latitudes where it's already warmer. And so what we see is that we lose this slope. The slope begins to decrease as we go above the tropopause. So if we take a look at temperature as we go up through a column of air, you'll see in the troposphere that temperature decreases with height. We know this is how the troposphere works. We get to the tropopause, in this example, between about 250 and 200 millibars, and then we go into the lowest stratosphere and temperatures begin to increase in height. Now this happens much more quickly, I shouldn't say quickly, this happens at much lower altitudes in polar air than it does in tropical air because polar air is colder, the tropopause is at a lower altitude, and so the stratosphere will also be located in terms of its base at a lower altitude as well, and we'll begin to get these temperature increases. So what we see is that the jet stream, where we get this core of strongest winds, this channel of strongest winds in the atmosphere, the jet stream is typically located in the middle latitudes in this zone between polar air and tropical air where we have our largest pressure gradient forces, where we see this greatest slope in our pressure, our constant pressure surface. And if we take a look at an example of a wind profile as we go from the surface up to 150 millibars in the middle latitudes where we have this little dashed circle, in this example, what you'll see is that just above the, above the surface, the wind speed is only five knots. And then the wind speed increases really rapidly, in part because we lose, we lose friction, and you'll see the impacts of, of lost friction in the lower part of the troposphere. So we lose our friction, certainly by the time we get to 850 millibars. And then the wind speeds continue to increase as we go up because of the increasing pressure gradient force. And you'll see that in this example, the strongest winds of about 145 knots are located about 270 millibars. And then when you go up above 270 millibars, this is above the altitude where we have our tropopause in the cold air. Now you'll see 
that the wind speeds actually begin to decrease. So winds don't just keep increasing all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. The strongest winds are located in the mid latitudes, basically at an altitude which is just above where the tropopause is located in the polar air. And so this explains why we have a jet stream and why the jet stream is located where it is. All right, so the pressure level slope between cold air is the greatest, that's where our jet stream is. All right, here's an example, and again, these are from, these are from your text. This is a finder millibar example, and you can take a look at this, and you can see our ISO heights in this case are these green curved lines. And then we have winds moving through our ISO height pattern. And you can see that the winds basically in this example range from about, I would say, 30 to 50 knots. We have one or two places where it's 50, 55 knots. And so here's what it looks like at 500 millibars. Now, as we move towards the tropopause, as we continue to go upward, our wind speeds are going to increase and our center of lowest heights, which is located at James Bay and at 500 millibars, is going to actually arch back to the west a little bit. So here is our isohyte pattern opening up and then arching back to the west a little bit. And now you'll see at 250 millibars, you'll see that our wind speeds are much stronger. So we have a lot of locations where our iso, where our isohytes are most packed together, where we have wind speeds in excess of 100 knots. And you can see almost everywhere on this map, the wind speeds are in excess of 50 knots, except over the Atlantic and over Hudson Bay, where there's much greater space between the isohytes the pressure gradient force is much smaller, and so we have, we have weaker winds. But here is our jet stream where our wind speeds are in excess of 70 knots. So again, an example of, of where we have our winds and this profile that I showed in the previous slide with our jet stream really located just a little bit below 250 millibars in this example. Just want to make, make clear that the jet stream, while meteorologists sloppily tend to refer to the jet stream as a continuous stream or channel of fast moving air, in fact, the jet stream is not continuous. So everything that's shaded is for wind speeds greater than 70 knots, which again, meteorologists classify as been, being the jet stream. And so you'll see that we actually get breaks in this jet stream where our pressure gradient force becomes small and the wind speeds fall below 70 knots. And so it is not just this channel of really rapidly moving air that circles in a wave-like pattern sinuously all the way around the Northern Hemisphere. In terms of the jet stream, the jet stream is much stronger during the cold season than it is during the warm season. So here is an example of winds in the Northern Hemisphere and actually across North America for a particular day. And here is another example in the summertime. And what you'll see during the summertime is that the jet stream tends to recede to the north and also be much weaker. And the reason that the jet stream is much weaker during the summer months is simply because the equator to pole temperature difference during the summer is much, much smaller than it is during the winter time. And because we have much larger equator to pole temperature differences during the winter time, we're going to get much more steeply sloped iso height lines in the mid latitudes during the winter than we do during the summer, and we're going to get much stronger upper level winds. So the equator to pole temperature differences are maximized during the winter, and that's when our jet stream is the strongest. A couple of other characteristics of the jet stream. The jet stream is typically located to the north of our frontal systems in the mid latitudes. So it's basically located above the cold air. It's in the cold air to the north of our frontal systems, to the north of our surface fronts. So we typically see this, this, this kind of feature play itself out in the northern hemisphere. And we're getting pretty close to the end now. And I just want to point out this one last pattern because you're going to be asked a question about this in your exercises in the lab. And so this is kind of our last example of an upper air pattern. This is called an omega or a rex block. And this is basically just an extremely amplified upper level wave pattern. When we get blocking patterns, blocking patterns occur when we get circular closed iso heights in our ridges and our troughs. We refer to the ridges as blocking highs and we refer to our troughs as cutoff lows. So we have blocking highs and cutoff lows. And what happens when we get blocking patterns like this, first of all, you can see that the iso height pattern basically arcs out the shape of the Greek letter omega. 
And, and meteorologists refer to it as a mega block for this reason. But again, you'll see Rex block in your, in your text. And so you need to just be aware of the name of Rex block as well as omega block. So when we get these omega blocks, and that's what I call them, and we get these cutoff lows and blocking highs, what happens is that these, these lows and highs in the upper atmosphere tend to basically become stationary. And so they kind of act like kind of rocks in a stream, big boulders in a stream. And what happens is the atmospheric circulation just basically flows around them. So when you've got cutoff lows and blocking highs, what you'll see is this very, very amplified meridional pattern where the flow just basically moves around these blocks. And so when, you've got to, when you have these blocking patterns, what happens when you're under the troughs is you have extended periods of unsettled weather. So cold, cloudy, wet in the wintertime, snowy. And if you're below these blocking highs, the exact opposite, warm, dry for an extended period of time. In the summertime, this can be associated with extreme heat. So think about heat domes in the southern United States, in the eastern United States. These are typically associated with blocking highs that are located just over the western Atlantic, and then they ridge their way into the southern United States. All right, this is my last slide before you get your assignment. And remember, this assignment is for students who are taking the distance class. If you are watching this video and you're in my face-to-face -face class, the assignment that you have with your lab group is different. All right, so for the, for the um, distance group and for everyone, actually, let me just give this chapter 12 preview. So we spent chapter six basically talking about the characteristics of the surface circulation and isobaric patterns. In this chapter, we talked about the, the characteristics of the upper level, in better words, the mid and upper tropospheric atmospheric circulation and height patterns. What I've done in these two chapters is basically to set the table for us to begin to discuss the three-dimensional structure of the atmosphere and the relationship between surface and upper level circulations. So at the end of chapter six's video, I asked you, how is it that we can have air that's converging about the center of a low pressure at the surface. So again, we have this counterclockwise and inward directed circulation, which is actually causing mass to accumulate in our column, which has a low pressure. How can we actually maintain low pressure? Well, the answer is that we actually diverge air out of the column at upper levels to maintain the low column weight. Well, we're going to talk about why that happens and how it happens moving forward in chapters 12 and 13. Conversely, at the surface with high pressure, we have mass that is basically diverging out of the center of the high. So we're moving air out of the high pressure center in a clockwise manner. Remember our clockwise and outward directed circulation. And so the question is, if we're moving mass out of the column, how can we maintain high pressure? Well, we're gonna to have to actually converge mass at upper levels, add mass to the column so that we can maintain the high weight, the high pressure of this column and maintain high pressure at the surface. So again, what we're going to do in the upcoming chapters is we're going to discuss how it is that the atmosphere acts to make this happen, to allow our highs and lows to maintain themselves and maintain their integrity over time, even though at the surface we are accumulating mass in a low and we are taking mass out with the high. All right, now, here are the exercise questions for the distance class. So these are your exercises for chapter seven. So you will be able to see this in the PowerPoint as well at our Canvas site. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to finish off the PowerPoint and get out of it. And I'm going to end this video. I'll post it on YouTube and I will post an announcement on the Canvas site when this Chapter 7 YouTube video is ready for you to view. But that's all for now. I hope this helps with your understanding of the upper level circulation.